podcast. What is up, College Across fans? You are watching episode 150 of the Lax Factor podcast. We are two, three fourths of the way to 200. I can't even do basic math. Uh, in today's episode, we're getting back to the roots. We are just going to preview this weekend's games, quite simply. We're going to talk about Duke at Notre Dame, which is a huge one, Virginia at North Carolina, Army at Loyola, Johns Hopkins at Ohio State, Albany at Syracuse, which is tomorrow night, and then we'll get into the calendar, the IL calendar, and talk about a lot more. As always, be sure to like, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and uh, you can also go to laxfactor.com, support us that way. We have t-shirts, hats, swag, all sorts of crap that you can get there. So do that, but let's get into this. Duke at Notre Dame. Number one, Duke. They are 10-0 and with wins over Syracuse and North Carolina in back-to-back -back weeks here on Thursday nights. Notre Dame is 5-1, and their only loss to Virginia, but the Irish are coming off beating Syracuse into the ground at the Dome, so they're feeling pretty good at the moment, especially considering Duke at Duke took Syracuse right down to a goal. Notre Dame comes up to the goes up to the dome and then puts the absolute big hurt on Syracuse. So they're feeling really good right now about their quality of play and their chances heading into Durham. Reasons that Notre Dame could upset Duke. Pat Kavanaugh, 11 goals, 26 helpers. He's smart, quick, tough and is capable of carrying the load in these primetime games. He's put up 9 point he uh, he put up 9 point games against Robert Morris and Syracuse. Six-point games against Bellarmine and Marquette. Five-point game against Cleveland State. And his lowest scoring output was the loss to UVA where he only had two points. So that's the only game that he's been under four points or five points uh, all season long so far. Now, granted, he had, hasn't played a whole lot of quality outside of Syracuse so far, but he put an, he absolutely massacred Syracuse in the Dome. I think it was four, four goals, five helpers in that one. So, you know. That's a, that's a pretty good game against a top 10 team. And uh, this kid, you know, he, if he continues to do this and is able to do this again against Duke on Thursday night while everyone's watching, and especially if Notre Dame hangs in the game, you're going to start talking about this kid as a potential uh, Twarton finalist with these types of numbers that he's putting up so far. Kyle Gallagher and Charles Leonard, they're another reason that Notre Dame should be optimistic coming into this game. So far, they've won 72% and 71% of their draws respectively, but they're hanging it, you know, just a touch under 72% as a team. And then, you know, we do like what Naso has been doing for Duke, but Naso's a freshman. We've got two very seasoned, very talented upperclassmen faceoff guys going up against Naso, who's kind of a man on his on an island in terms of effectiveness for Duke. And you got to like Notre Dame's chances at winning the possession battle there unless Naso can just get busy and disrupt that. The other, another reason Notre Dame should be optimistic, Penn transfer Kyle Thornton. He's been a monster on the defensive side of the ball. 11 cause turnovers, 11 GBs. Boyers also played really well for Notre Dame at LSM. 14 ground balls and 8 cause turnovers. So Notre Dame, we knew they were coming into this, that we knew they were going to be a solid defensive team. They're just proving it, and, and some of their new faces like Thornton are really helping shore that side of the ball up. They've proven that they are one of the best defensive teams in the country. Don't front on uh, Entman I, uh, also. Entman and Cage has been tough for them. Now, there's lots of reasons why I think Duke can hold up in this one. Their attack is crazy. Michael Sowers, 22 and 29. Joe Robertson, 27 and 12. Brennan O'Neill, 27 and 5. Forget about it. I mean, three three of the best attackmen in the country as a unit with Mike Sowers, whom I believe to be the best attackman in the country. Robertson, one of the best overall attackmen, a real real quality off ball threat and, and O'Neill's kind of coming into his own now as he's starting to figure out the D1 level and figure out how he gels with this group of veterans. Montgomery, he's emerged as one of the best midfielders in the country. No more talk about number 15's potential. We heard a lot about that, including for me. He, you know, his after his sophomore year, kid had a really big year. And then I think it was last year would have been his junior year where things were going a little rough for that line, that entire first line, not just Montgomery. But uh, Montgomery so far this season, he's emerged as one of the best midfielders in the country. Uh, you know, cashing, he's cashing checks, as they say right now. He had all this potential and all this, all this, um, um, value that he had built up in terms of just people waiting for that to just pop off and it is popping off big time for Montgomery right now. 
just playing great, distributing the ball like a veteran, improved his shooting percentage. His 11 goals and 15 assists are huge for this Duke team. Duke is efficient. They're efficient on offense because of those attackmen, because of the quality midfielders, but Montgomery is kind of the glue that's holding it all together in terms of being one, being their best midfielder right now and then playing like a leader and leading this team. He's, he's been incredible. JT Giles Harris and Duke's defensive strength is no, uh, no Notre Dame's offensive strength as well. Notre Dame is going to run some motion. They're going to hit cutters. Kavanaugh's going to dodge and open things up. But good news for Duke is that's what they're good at. Syracuse is has been traditionally a terrible off-ball lacrosse team over the last couple of years. Duke with JT Giles Harris is one of the best overall defensemen, excels off-ball. That's going to be huge for Duke in this game against Notre Dame. So Notre Dame's strength is also Duke's strength defensively. And then Naso. I think we talked about Leonard and and Gallagher at the faceoff dot, but I think that Duke likes what Naso's done. And I think Duke likes Naso to be able to go in there and win 40 to 55% of the draws, depending on how things go down. I think Naso's capable of winning this battle. It's not likely, but he is definitely capable of doing so. So just as long as he can compete and not just get smoked at the face-off dot like Syracuse did last weekend. Duke's going to be okay. Both teams, solid keepers. Entman for Notre Dame and Adler for Duke. Either guy is capable of just keeping you in the game or winning a game for you, as both have evidenced, uh, both have proven. And then uh, my prediction in this one, I'm going with Duke by two. I, I Notre Dame could come out and beat them by two or three. It, it, that's not out of the realm of possibility. But in the end, Duke is good. I like Duke to continue to roll in the ACC from a probability standpoint. Duke is probably going to win this game as the favorite. So I do. I like Duke by two goals, maybe an empty netter at the end to open things up. But expect a dogfight. Every ACC game moving forward, even that, even with the Notre Dame and Syracuse score, things could flip the next time around. So I expect to see a really solid game out of this one way or another. The next game that we have to talk about, Virginia at UNC. Now, they already played. UNC already beat Virginia. UNC was putting the you know kind of a, the big hurt on Virginia for a little while before G- Virginia got their act together and started playing tough. But reasons I think that UVA should be optimistic. Colin Schellenberger, he's proven that he's ready for the prime time and he can be one of the main anchors for this offense. He's he has a lot of guys around him, a lot of offensive weapons around him, but he's leading this team in scoring, even with the upperclassmen. He's got 44 points off 18 goals and 26 assists. When called upon, this kid's held up. He went for four goals and three helpers in UVA's win over Richmond. That was last week, but he had a quiet game, one assist and just two shots in uh, Virginia's win over Notre Dame. UVA is hoping you know, to, to see at least the UNC version of Schellenberger. He was, uh, what, two and three against UNC in the loss to, to Carolina the last time these teams met. But Schellenberger is emerging as a, as a quality attackman, and by the end of the season, we're going to be calling him one of the better attackmen in the country. He, might, he probably already is. I mean, the kid's putting up points to prove that he belongs. Petey LaSala, he won 21 of 31 draws in UVA's loss to UNC earlier in the season. They'll need him to do that again to have a shot at winning this game. He's going to have to win the lion's share of the draws. Maybe not the lion's share, but at least a really hungry goat's share of the draws. And I think he can. I think he's capable of winning that battle for UVA, especially against North Carolina. And then Jared Connors on defense, anchoring that defense. 41 GBs, 14 caused turnovers, two goals, and three helpers. As expected, dude was, you know, everyone knew Connors was going to have a monster season running around with his LS, with his long pole, and uh, he has continued to do that. So UVA, there's they have a lot of bright spots, a lot of things they do well. Technically, they match up well with North Carolina. Carolina, I thought, based on the defensive style they play because they, they like to come out and press. I think Virginia's problem is they're a little bit of a reckless, you know, kind of, kind of controlled chaos, and chaos is what UNC ends up excelling in. I think UNC is just overall too good. I think they will win again by two or three goals overall. UVA, you know, they'll make sure. I think UVA, they want, they're not going to come in and pull a high point. They're not going to come in and get waxed the second time around against UNC like High Point did. High Point hung the first game. They got smoked by UNC that second game. But I think that they're still not quite there. And I think UNC offensively is just a little bit too good. I think it's going to be a shootout. And I like UNC to win a chaotic game, uh, a chaotic shootout. But it'll be close. I think it will be close. Next one, I want to talk about Army at Loyola. Loyola lost to Towson, uh, and then they picked up, 
you know, hold on. Loyola lost to Towson two weeks ago, and then they pick up and they get a win over Navy last week. Needed a bit of agua. Army, they lost to UVA their first game of the year. They went on a four-game winning streak, including a beatdown of Syracuse at the Dome, but then they lost a one-goal game to Lehigh last week. So that was the Army's first loss in, you know, first first loss in like four or five weeks. Uh, moral of this story is if Loyola shows up on both ends of the field, they can hang with anybody. They've proven that. But I like Nick Turn in this one, and I think Army overall is the better team when you compare them, you know, based on consistency in terms of how they've played each and every game. X factor for Loyola, Bailey Savio. And I mean, he's not an unknown, and I'm going to talk about another X factor that's not an unknown factor in this game, but he's going to be key in this game. Bailey Savio for Loyola. If he can win 60% of the draws, keep the possession battle in Loyola's favor, I think that's going to be a huge advantage for them, and it's an advantage they're going to need to be able to have a shot at winning this game. It'll help them maybe make up for some of the damage that Nick Turn is sure to to put on on uh, on Loyola. X factor for Army, and once again, not an unknown X factor. Just a, it's going to be key in this game, and this person can win this game. Wyatt Schupler in cage for Army. Not like going to be a surprise contribution or anything like that, but I'm just saying, all American caliber, all American caliber keeper. I don't even think it's caliber. I think he's going to be an all American keeper. But uh, he is an X factor in a sense that he can win the game for Army. He can take it, you know, if Bailey Savio does his thing and he wins 60, 65% of the faceoffs in this one, Schupler can even that out by making saves. A Wyatt Schupler save or a robbery on some shot that should go in, which he's very, you know, he does all the time, that's as good as a Bailey Savio save, and that gets them back. My prediction in this one, I think Army in the end is going to kind of outlast Loyola. I think Army is going to play a more consistent game from the beginning to the end. I predict Army by three goals or so in this one. Another game that we must talk about Johns Hopkins at Ohio State. OSU is 3 and 4, Hopkins 2 and 5. Both of these teams badly in need of a win. Ohio State, they've lost two of their last three and they have Maryland up next after this Hopkins game. So they do not want to lose this one and then have to go in to face Maryland. Hopkins, they started out 2 and 2. Things were starting to look good. For them, and now they've lost three straight after beating Penn State. Ohio State beat Hopkins 14-8 in their first game of the season, but this is a, is a better Hopkins team depending on which day they, they play, even if not by that much uh, based on when they played last time. Both teams capable of winning this game, but I think we see Ohio State prove that they're that tier below Rutgers, and I think they're going to end up winning this game by two or three goals. Could be more. I wouldn't, once again, it's a toss-up. I wouldn't be the least bit surprised if Hopkins did win it. Hopkins is a very capable team. They just have not played consistent lacrosse. They're not playing full games out. And Ohio State has been a little bit better in that respect. I like Ohio State offensively. Myers, Jack Myers, he's been huge for Ohio State over the last four games. He's had at least four points in each game over the last four, but he's been at his best against Ohio State's best competition. He had four goals and a helper in their loss to Rutgers, five points in their first meeting against Rutgers, and he had four goals and two assists against Maryland in their loss to Maryland. So I expect him to do some damage against the Jays, so watch out for Jack Myers for Ohio State. Ohio State, woo! Uh, Albany at Syracuse. That's tomorrow night's game at the Dome. Uh, it's the only action that we see tomorrow night, but it's another ACC matchup on a Thursday night game. Cuse is coming off that drubbing at the hands of Notre Dame. Albany's coming off a 17-6 win over UMass Yole, or UMass Yole, UMass Lowell. Hardly a big accomplishment, but they and they also lost to Stony Brook the week before that, a team that Syracuse beat in the Dome. So Cuse, they're going to be angry. I expect them to come out and play angry. Albany, they're still trying to figure things out post uh, Dehoga Nanakoke. They've obviously lost Nanakoke, so this will be the first time Syracuse faces uh, Albany without Nanakoke in quite a while. So I, prediction in that one, I think Cuse wins this one by five, six goals or so because I think they play angry. I don't think they're necessarily that much better than Albany. They probably are. It uh, just depends on how badly they end up rebounding and beating Albany at the faceoff dot, which Syracuse should be more than capable of doing. Uh, what other games we got here? A big one Friday night is uh, Hofstra at UMass. Now, UMass beat Hofstra by a margin in their first meeting. But, you know, both teams are, are pretty solid. Let's look at the preview here. Uh, both teams, uh, UMass sitting at 3-2, and two, Hofstra sitting at 5-2, and two, so they both have a couple of losses. Both of them kind of chilling at the top of that conference 
in the end. Uh, let's see here. What is the conference standings here? Uh, we're looking at Delaware. Oddly enough, sitting at the top of this conference, I think Delaware has Drexel next, and Drexel just beat UMass. UMass and Hofstra are both sitting at two and one, so this will be a huge one here. If Hofstra can can flip the script here, get a win in this one, they're sitting at three and one in the conference with UMass at three and two. So they'll have kind of that half game, or I don't remember how it works, but they'll be sitting at a half game below them, or maybe it was a half game above because they'll have one less loss. But the CAA is a you know it's a close conference here at this stage and anybody could win it but you know you got Delaware Hofstra and UMass kind of sitting at the top with Drexel if they could win out Drexel's right up there in the hunt for this crap so I think that's a good game I am going to go out on a limb and I'm going to predict that UMass is going to bounce back pick up a win I think it'll be closer than the last game though I bet you I bet you UMass only wins this one by one or two goals over Hofstra Tierney needs to like tear it up here to be able to keep himself in consideration for that Tewarton finalist spot as well what do we got here other games another big one is going to be Bryant and LIU in terms of conference uh, play here both teams are sitting at five and two right now both teams let's see LIU is five and one in the conference with a five and two overall record. Bryant is five and two overall with a three and one conference record. So both teams coming into this one with one conference loss, but LIU is playing some pretty quality lacrosse. Their schedule's not that tough, but in the end, it's the conference schedule that matters here when you come down to this and both teams right now sitting there with one loss. In the end, I think in theory, Bryant is the better ball club, and I'm going to pick Bryant to win in a nail-biter. Let's say one goal win here, but don't be surprised if LIU comes in with their offensive firepower and, and rolls them. You know, I mean, LIU could come in and beat Bryant by four or five. I just don't think that's going to happen. I think veteran-wise, uh, veteran I like Bryant's core group a little bit better. They've kind of been here before playing in these types of big conference games. So in the end, I do like Bryant to beat LIU, give them their second conference loss, their third loss of the season, but it should be a hell of a ball game. And then my the big boy here that I'm a big fan of is um, Will Snelders. He's got he's 10 and 5 so far this season, but uh, Richie LaCalandra, 24 and 20 for LIU. So watch out for them. What else we got? What else we got? Delaware and Drexel. Drexel is playing at Delaware, so that's going to be a huge conference game there for Delaware. They can try to stay unbeaten in the conference with that one. Georgetown Marquette. I think Georgetown's going to win that one probably by a margin. Another decent one, Air Force at Jacksonville. I picked Jacksonville in our picks. Rutgers at Penn State. We know who we know who we like in this one. I'd like Rutgers to take it to Penn State. I think Ruck, I think Maryland's going to go undefeated in the big, and I think Rutgers is going to sweep the big beyond that. Let me make sure they haven't already lost a second conference game. Now Rutgers only lost so far to Maryland, so they got three games left. Penn State, Johns Hopkins, and Michigan. I think they'll 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 sweep in those three. They're going to sweep the conference outside of Maryland, and uh, that's just how it's going to go. In in the big, you got Maryland, you got Rutgers, and then who who knows after that? But I'm pretty sure it looks like Ohio State is about to own that spot. Ohio State can own that spot with a win over Hopkins here this weekend. That'll be big for them. Huge game really for them when you when you talk about the implications. Um, Fairfield at Towson, that ought to be a good one. I mean that that conference every game has been a dogfight so far, and you've seen a lot of weird weird results. St. Joseph's at Hobart. St. Joe's is actually undefeated in the NEC so far. I don't think they're going to remain that way though. I like Hobart in this one. Hobart coming off a win over Bryant. Let me just make sure that I'm not popping off and I'm saying dumb things. Yeah, Hobart beat Bryant just now, eleven to ten. Just now they beat him this weekend, eleven to ten. So as that conference shakes out, it's LIU right now at the top at five and one, simply because they've won five games and only lost one. St. Joseph's is three and zero. Oh, Bryant three and one. Hobart three and one in conference play. So St. Joseph's is the team sitting here without a conference loss so far. But St. Joseph's wins are like Wagner, Sacred Heart, Merrimack, Mount St. Mary's. They lost to both Delaware and Towson. Close game, so. So I don't know. St. Joseph's is legit, and this is kind of their, hey, prove how good you are. Are you guys top of the NEC level good, or are you just, you know, kind of, is this just a byproduct of so far only playing the worst teams 
in their conference. But I, I, I like Hobart, but it's going to be another one of those NEC dogfights that we've seen. So surprisingly, a couple of conferences that are playing out very in a very interesting way. The America East, I think, has just one of those conferences where you still don't know who is going to end up walking away with it. The NEC is that way. The CAA is that way. Even the ACC to a degree, although it looks like Duke is starting to separate. Duke wins this game we against Notre Dame this weekend. We now know, boom, they are king shits in the ACC, but there's a bunch of conferences that are all up in the air at this stage still, and we don't know what the hell is going on. Maryland, they're going to beat up on Michigan, as we said. Boston, you and Colgate playing a big one. Villanova at Denver. That could be a big one, albeit I like Denver to win that one. Navy at Lehigh. Lehigh coming off the win over Army. If Lehigh can beat Navy as well, now they're starting to say, hey, we're the team that should be in the driver's seat. Uh, whatever keeps telling me Lehigh's the best team in Pennsylvania. I don't know why, but I believe him, yo. I don't know why, but I believe him. That's a, a kind of a, a bad, bad quote from Half-Baked. I got the words wrong, but you get the idea. Um, Vermont's going to beat up on UMass Lowell, Lafayette and Bucknell. Yeah. So that's pretty much the games. Then we have, uh, on Sunday, the only real quality game on Sunday, Richmond's going to beat up on Mercer, but we've got UMBC at Albany. So again, two more, two teams, UMBC has played really well. Uh, who, who'd they beat Stony Brook? <clears throat> Cause I thought Stony Brook was going to kind of be King shit in the America East. I believe it was UMBC that beat, oh no, UMBC beat Vermont and Stony Brook. So, I mean, here we go. UMBC, one goal win over Stony Brook, three goal win over Hartford. They lost to Binghamton. That's the blemish for UMBC. Right now, UMBC would be undefeated and sitting at, at the top of the America East if not for that one goal loss at Binghamton. And then they turned around and they beat Binghamton the week after by a goal. Vermont, uh, they beat last week 10-8. to So, this is a huge game here. Right now, the, the conference shakes out. Three teams at the top at four and one. Stony Brook's four and one, UMBC's four and one, and Vermont's four and one. Albany and Binghamton are both sitting at three and two. So I mean this conference has a bunch of teams just all sitting at the top, just waiting for somebody else to lose. So if UMBC can pull off this win, that's going to be uh, big for them. Uh, because then they'll be five and one in the conference with a win over another one of those teams. And that kind of buries Albany. That puts, if, if Albany loses this one to UMBC, Albany's now at three and three, and that kind of makes their, their chance of winning this, this conference really bad. Although I believe there is a conference tournament for the America East. So they st every team still has a shot at getting into the tournament, but you really want to win these games, make a statement for yourself. So sadly, that is it here. All we have is previews to talk about it. We kind of needed a reset. We were It was getting rough talking about Sunday's games and then not talking about the games coming up during the week or whatnot. So I wanted to just do a straight preview. We have a couple of really big games and then a bunch of you know games that most aren't on most people's radars, but if you give them a chance and watch them, you're going to see some really good conference matchups here. So I'm going to get the heck out of here. We will be back again Saturday morning for the live stream and then back again Sunday with the recaps from Saturday's games. And once again, I keep saying and keep promising we're going to put more content out. I have stuff written, just have to record it. And then once we have a backlog, we'll start putting uh, just audio only shows out in the middle of the week on day on off days that we're not doing a video show. So be sure to check that out but as always thank you for watching thank you for listening go to laxfactor.com support us there you can get t-shirts and crap like that and uh, as always you can listen to us anywhere where there's audio podcasts be sure to go out and find us um, bookmark us download the shows like the shows do whatever you got to do so that you start getting notified when we put out the audio only shows that are going to start dropping as well but that's it thank you for watching thank you for listening and hoost is out 